the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all king-size cigarettes, brings you Dragnet on both radio and television. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a juvenile division. You get a call from one of the bus line terminals in your city. A seven-week-old baby has been abandoned in the depot waiting room. There's no sign of the mother, no lead to her whereabouts. Your job, find her. Compare Fatima with any other king-size cigarette. Prove Fatima quality yourself. You'll find Fatima's length filters the smoke 85 millimeters for your protection. Fatima's length cools the smoke for your protection. You'll find Fatima's length gives you those extra puffs, 21% longer than standard cigarette size. And in Fatima, you get an extra mild and soothing smoke, plus the added protection of Fatima quality. Definitely the best quality in its class, but the same price as the cigarette you're now smoking. Buy Fatima in the bright, sunny yellow pack. Best of all king-size cigarettes. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step-by-step step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Wednesday, August 14th. It was hot in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of Juvenile Division. My partner's Ed Jacobs. The boss is Captain Stein, Commander Juvenile Division. My name's Friday. We were on the way out from the office, and it was 11.05 a.m. when we got to the corner of 6th and Los Angeles streets, the bus depot. Excuse me, ma'am. You Mrs. Lewis? Yes, that's right. Are you the police? Yes, ma'am. This is my partner, Sergeant Jacobs. My name's Friday, Juvenile Division. Well, how do you do? I'm certainly glad you're here. I've been waiting around this depot for hours. I don't know what to do. Baby must be getting pretty heavy, ma'am. Like to sit down over here and tell us about it? All right. Thank you. Oh, hey, that's all right, honey. You sleep now. Sleepy, bye. Poor little thing. It's just a shame. Yes, ma'am. The report we got didn't go into detail. Some woman left the baby with you, is that right? Yes, as soon as we got off the bus this morning. She said she'd only be gone a few minutes. It's been hours. I don't know what to do. Well, did you know the woman, Mrs. Lewis? Her name's Dorothy Miller. She's from Arizona, Tucson. We got off the bus, and she asked me if I'd hold her baby while she went to get her luggage. She said she'd meet me right there by the information desk. I've been waiting ever since. She hasn't come back. I, I don't know what to think of it. Well, how well do you know this Dorothy Miller, ma'am? Well, not too well, but she seemed like such a nice girl. Friendly and very sociable. We sat together all the way in. You got on the bus with her too, son, is that it? Oh, no. I'm from Cincinnati. I got on the bus there and then went down to Dallas. Had a visit with an aunt of mine down there. I see. And I got another bus at Dallas to come out here. Went along the southern route. Very nice. Same bus I came in on this morning. I'm out here to meet my husband, army man. He's coming in on a transport from overseas. Coming in tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Now, you say this Dorothy Miller boarded the bus at Tucson with a baby. She rode all the way into Los Angeles with you. Yes, right into this depot. She sat in the seat next to mine. We struck up a conversation. Got to be quite good friends. He's such a cute baby. I just can't imagine. Well, how'd the Miller woman seem to you, Miss Lewis? All right? I mean, was there anything odd about her behavior? Anything unusual? No, nothing at all. Seemed to me to be a perfect mother. Took good care of the baby. Wonderful care. That's what's so upsetting. For her to go off like this. Leave, leave her baby with a stranger. It doesn't make any sense. Well, now, you say you talked to this Dorothy Miller quite a bit along the way, ma'am. I beg your pardon? What was that? Maybe if we move out the car, Joe. It'd be a lot easier to talk out there. Yeah, that's a good idea. Ms. Lewis, would you mind coming along with us to our car? It's parked just down the street. Should be a little quieter there, huh? Yes, all right. All right I have these two valises here. All right, I'll here. get them, ma'am. Oh, thank you. I'll be out this way for you. Excuse me. I'm sorry. Pardon me. Sorry? Pardon us, please. Help you with one of those ads? No, that's okay. Just down the street here, ma'am. Oh, my. Isn't it a beautiful day? What a shame, all this trouble. Yes, ma'am. Uh, can you make it all right, Ms. Lewis? Oh, yes, I think so. Right. I'm going to slip the police's in back. There's plenty of room there. Yeah, okay. Give me a hand. Okay. Now, about this Miller woman, Ms. Lewis, I was going to ask you. Yes? 
Well, did she happen to tell you where she lived in Tucson, if she had any people there, any family? No, I don't recall anything like that. She talked about some of the girlfriends she had there, their babies. She didn't mention any of them by name, though. How about her description, Mrs. Lewis? Anything unusual there? No, I wouldn't say so. Small girl, five foot three or four, I'd say. 110 or 15 pounds, dark hair, shoulder length, dark eyes, nice complexion, very pretty eyes. About how old would you say? 20, that's what she told me anyway. She said she had a birthday in May. I remember we talked about that. She was born under the same sign I was, Tars the Bull. Mm-hmm. And all the talk she had with this Miller girl, she never gave you any reason to think that anything was wrong with her? She didn't seem to be despondent, depressed about anything? Perfectly normal girl, as far as I could tell. I just can't get over it. I can't imagine her doing anything like this. Well, how'd she seem this morning when you got in on the bus? Pretty much the same? Yes, I think so. We got off the bus together. She had her hands full with the baby, so I helped her off with the hand valise she was carrying. Mm -hmm. When we got inside the waiting room, she mentioned that she had to go pick up some luggage from the check stand. She asked me if I'd mind very much holding her baby while she went after it. I said, no, not at all. She went around the corner of the baggage stand, and that's the last I saw of her. You checked around the depot, did you, and you had her page? I talked to everyone in the place. The porters, ticket clerks, information desk, traveler's aid. Not one of them could help. I tried everybody. Oh, dear. It's all right now. We'll find your mother. Yes. You try and see. Good tomorrow. <laughs> Wonderful. It's adorable. It's a little boy. She said his name's Stephen. Yes, ma'am. Oh, you say you've been waiting around the depot three hours. Has the baby been fed? Yes, this hand lease the Miller girl gave me to hold. I found a bottle full of formula in it. The man at the coffee shop warmed it for me. The little fella here finished it off. The way he eats, I guess he'll be wanting some more pretty soon. Uh, I guess we better get back in, huh? Yeah, I guess so. I can't imagine it. I just can't imagine it. Ma'am? This little boy, just look at him. Yes, ma'am. Her own baby. So small and helpless. How could she go off and leave him? Well, I guess she had a reason. Must have been important. A seven-weeks-old baby? What's more important than that? Before we left the bus depot, Ed contacted the clerk at the depot information desk and left our card with him. If anyone came in to make inquiries about the abandoned child, he was to advise them to get in touch with us. 11.48 a.m. The woman who'd been left with the baby, Mrs. Marjorie Lewis agreed to return to the office with us and give us a complete report on everything she knew about the case. As soon as we got back, we briefed Captain Stein on what happened, and he assigned policewoman Betty Stone to come in and help out with the baby. A cursory examination seemed to indicate there was nothing abnormal about the baby, no apparent deformities. We checked the blanket and the baby's clothing, but we found no identifying marks of any use to us. Policewoman Stone made the baby comfortable for the time being, and then she began to check through the contents of the small valise which the baby's mother had left with Mrs. Lewis. It contained the usual assortment, baby oil, powder, dextrose, a few cans of milk, a couple of blankets, and a supply of diapers. Ed and I continued to interview Mrs. Lewis. This is the Miller woman's first baby, do you know, or did she happen to mention it? Yes, it's her first. That's what she told me anyway. Did you talk about the baby's health at all? Was there any trouble there, would you know? Well, she did say she had some trouble with the formula at first. It didn't seem to suit the baby. It wasn't anything serious, though. As a matter of fact, that does worry me a little bit, Sergeant. What's that? The baby's formula. Mrs. Miller did say it had to be fixed a special way. Some special medicine she put in it, too. Are you sure the baby's going to get good care? Yes, ma'am. There's no need to worry. He'll be moved to General Hospital. I'll look after him. But the special formula, the medicine she was giving him... Will they know about that? Will they know how to feed him? Well, they've handled cases like this before, Ms. Lewis. They're pretty competent people. They'll know what to do. Well, I surely hope so. I don't know why I'm so concerned. I guess it's just that the little fellow's so small, all alone, so helpless. Terrible shame. Yes, ma'am. About this special formula the baby has to have, what's the reason for that? Would you know? The baby been sick recently? No, I don't think so. Mrs. Miller did say he was a little sickly when he was born, spent a little time in an incubator... I don't believe it was critical, though. At least I didn't gather that. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Lewis. Appreciate your cooperation, everything you've done on this. Not at all, Sergeant. I only wish I could be more help. You mind telling us where you'll be stopping in town, ma'am? Possibly we might have to contact you again. Well, I don't have any reservations. I was thinking of staying at a hotel close to downtown. There was a big convention in town. Most of the places are pretty crowded. We'd be glad to help you find a hotel space, if you like. Oh, well, that's certainly very nice of you. Not at all. Sergeant Friday, could I see you a minute, please? Yes, all right. Would you excuse me, please? Surely. Yeah, Betty. For a policewoman, I'm not bad at checking diapers. How do you mean? Over here. The valise the mother left with Mrs. Lewis. Mm-hmm. Did you come up with anything? 
Didn't think so at first. Went over the valise, everything inside, nothing. And I started putting the things back in the bag. Found this in that stack of diapers there. Uh-huh. Paid receipt for a hospital bill. Maternity ward. Santa Maria Hospital, Tucson. There's the patient's name, right there at the top. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Dorothy Miller. 12.30 p.m. A local broadcast and an APB was gotten out on Dorothy Miller. And then we sent a communication to the Tucson Police Department laying out the story for them and asking them to check with the Santa Maria Hospital there for a possible lead on the missing mother. Meantime, the baby was removed to General Hospital. We found accommodations for Mrs. Lewis at a downtown hotel. We dropped her off there, and then we drove back to the bus depot on 6th Street. We tried to locate the driver of the bus on which the Miller woman and her baby had arrived that morning. We were told he was off duty and that he wouldn't report back until 8 o'clock the following morning. We left our card along with a message for the driver, asking him to contact us as soon as he returned. For the rest of the afternoon, Ed and I, along with the two other men from juvenile division, checked with all the bus depot personnel, but we were unable to turn up any kind of a lead. After that, we started making the rounds of the hotels, bars, restaurants, and taxi cab stands in the neighborhood. The same results, nothing. 7.55 a.m. the following morning, I reported back in for work. Morning, Joe. Hi, Betty. Head check in yet? Uh-huh. Went out for a minute, so he'd be right back. What do you know? Anything new? Communication for you from the Tucson PD. Kick back on that query you got off to him yesterday. Think Ed left it in your box. Oh, thanks, Betty. I'll get it. Mm-hmm. Did you see this? Ed showed it to me, yeah. Confirms the fact the woman had her baby in that hospital. Still not much help, though. Yeah, I see. They checked out her last known address in Tucson. She moved. No forwarding address. No line on her relatives or friends. The day the baby was born seems to check out. Mm-hmm. June 24th. Makes the baby just about seven weeks old, doesn't it? This part here doesn't make much sense, though, does it? The Miller girl's description? Yeah. Ms. Lewis said Dorothy Miller was small and dark, long, dark hair, dark eyes. People at the hospital describe her as being blonde, fairly tall, blue eyes, long, blonde hair, about 29, 30 years old. Mrs. Lewis said the Miller girl just turned 20, didn't she? Yeah, that's what she said. Sure doesn't figure. A little too much to write off as coincidence. Two Dorothy Millers having babies. Same day, same hospital. No, I just happened to think. This description of the Miller girl. Uh-huh. Fairly tall, long blonde hair. Ms. Lewis has long blonde hair, hasn't she? Benny? Oh, hi, Joe. Hi, what's doing? The bus driver we wanted to talk to, the one who drove the bus, Dorothy Miller, and the baby came in on yesterday. Yeah. That description Ms. Lewis gave us of Dorothy Miller? Mm-hmm. Driver doesn't remember anyone like that on his bus. He remembered Ms. Lewis, though. She didn't get on the bus at Dallas. She didn't sit next to a young girl with a baby, either. Driver says he's sure of it. Oh, and what's the pitch? Ms. Lewis got on the bus at Tucson. She had a baby in her arms. You are listening to Dragnet, authentic stories of your police force in action. Fatima, America's first largest selling blended cigarette. Now king size. The only king size cigarette that makes you this money back guarantee. Buy a pack of Fatimas. Enjoy Fatima quality, extra mildness, and superbly blended tobaccos. If you're not convinced Fatima is better than the king size cigarette you're now smoking, just return the pack and the unsmoked Fatimas by August 1st, 1952, for your money back plus postage. Fatima, Box 37, New York 1. Buy Fatima. Compare them with any other king size cigarette. One, Fatima's length filters the smoke 85 millimeters for your protection. Two, Fatima's length cools the smoke for your protection. Three, Fatima's length gives you those extra puffs, 21% longer than standard cigarette size. And you get an extra mild and soothing smoke, plus the added protection of Fatima quality. Remember, more smokers now insist on Fatima quality than ever before. Buy Fatima. In Fatima, the difference is quality. Best of all, king-size cigarettes. Eight thirty-five a.m. Ed Jacobs and I went into the adjoining room where we continued to interview the bus driver, the same man who'd been driving the bus on which Mrs. Lewis and the abandoned baby and his mother supposedly had arrived in Los Angeles the day before. The more we talked to the driver, the more he convinced us that the story we'd gotten from Mrs. Marjorie Lewis was a long way from the truth. He repeated that he was absolutely sure that Mrs. Lewis did not get on the bus at Dallas, that she boarded the bus at Tucson, and that at the time she got on, she was holding a baby in her arms. 
He was just as positive that Mrs. Lewis held the baby in her arms all the way to Los Angeles and that she did not sit next to a young, dark-haired girl, but an elderly woman. He also told us that none of his passengers on that particular trip fitted the description of Dorothy Miller as given us by Mrs. Lewis. 8.50 a.m. Before the bus driver left, we got his address and a phone number where we could get in touch with him if necessary. 9.05 a.m. Ed and I got in the car, drove to the downtown hotel where Mrs. Lewis was staying and called her room from the phone in the lobby. She told us that her husband, Army Captain Walter Lewis, had arrived in from overseas earlier that morning and checked in at the hotel. I asked her if her husband was with her, but she said no. He was downstairs at the hotel barber shop. Ed and I got in the elevator and went up to see her. Outside and down in the street, you could hear the sounds of a parade passing by. It was American Legion Convention Week, the traditional parade. Some parade, isn't it? Yeah, it's beautiful. Oh, good morning, officers. Come in, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. What happened? Did you find out anything? Well, a few things, ma'am. We've been checking around. Two or three more questions we'd like to ask you, if you don't mind. Well, no, not at all. How's the baby? Are they taking care of him? Is he all right? Yes, ma'am. He's fine. We checked at the hospital. He's doing real well. Oh, I'm glad. And the Miller girl, Dorothy Miller, did you find out anything? We haven't been able to locate her. No trace for her at all. That's why we're here, Miss Lewis. A few things we'd like to have you straighten out for us. Well, I'll do anything I can to help. I think I already told you everything I could remember about the girl. Well, now, we're going to be honest with you, Miss Lewis. We don't think you're telling the truth. What? I don't understand. We talked to the man who was driving the bus you came in on yesterday. The same bus you say Dorothy Miller and her baby were on? Yes, that's right. Well, the bus driver couldn't remember the Miller girl. Told us none of his passengers even came close to her description. Well, there was quite a few people on the bus. I guess you can't blame him for not remembering her. He remembered you, Miss Lewis. You were sitting near the front of the bus. He doesn't remember anyone with the baby sitting next to you, though. I guess he made a mistake. He can't remember everything. Well, he said you were holding the baby. I don't understand this. What is it you're trying to find out? Well, when we talked to you yesterday, you told us that you got on the bus at Dallas. Isn't that right? Yes. What would that have to do with it? Well, the bus driver says you got on at Tucson. You seem to remember it pretty well. He says when you got on the bus, you were holding a baby in your arms. Well, that's silly. He's wrong. He must have me confused with somebody else. I don't see how, ma'am. He says you were the only woman on the bus with a baby. What's the point of this, Sergeant? I don't understand any of this. Well, frankly, neither do we. I don't know why you're lying to us about this, but apparently you are. You're wrong. I'm not lying. It happened just the way I told you. The girl gave me the baby to hold, and then she disappeared. There's no reason for me to lie about that. We found a receipt for a hospital bill in that valise with the baby's things in it. The receipt was made out to Dorothy Miller. Well, that proves it, doesn't it? She was on the bus with me, and her baby was with her. The check was made with the hospital at Tucson. They remembered the name Dorothy Miller. She gave birth to a baby boy about seven weeks ago. She wasn't the same girl you described to us, though. Description wasn't even close. Well, then it must be a mistake. I guess somebody made a mistake. I can't understand any of this. Well, they sent us back a description of the Dorothy Miller who stayed at the hospital. It was a fairly tall woman, long blonde hair, about 29 or 30. Yes. Description fits you, Miss Lewis. Fits almost perfectly. Well, it's wrong. It has to be wrong. The whole thing's a mistake. I beg your pardon? I say the whole thing is a mistake. It has to be wrong. No, I don't think so, ma'am. Why don't you tell me? What do you think? Tell me, please. There is no Dorothy Miller. There never was. There's no such person, ma'am. That's what you really think? I invented it? I made it all up? Did you? And the baby? What about him? There's no Dorothy Miller. What about the baby? I don't know. Do you want to tell us? Ms. Lewis? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Ms. Lewis, can I get something for you? Thank you. I'm all right. I suppose I knew it would happen sometime. I try not to think about it. Yeah? When you called from downstairs, I knew you'd found out. That's why you asked. My husband was with me, isn't it? He didn't want to embarrass me. We wanted to give you a chance to tell your side of the story. Thought maybe you wanted to keep it from your husband. No, it doesn't matter. I'll tell him. He'll be back in a few minutes. He can do anything he wants. I won't blame him. He'll pack his bags and walk out and leave, and I won't blame him. All right, you no. want to tell us about it? Well, I think you know my baby. My own baby, and I couldn't keep him. There wasn't anything else to do. Nothing. My own baby. You made up the whole story about the girl, Dorothy Miller, her leaving the baby with you? Miss Lewis? Such a beautiful day, isn't it? Big crowd for the parade. They lined all the way up the street. You must have had a reason for it, Miss Lewis, giving your baby away. Now, do you want to tell us about it? Yes, all right. Won't make any difference. It's done. It's all done. It's 
It's my husband I'm thinking about, Walter. I'm going to have to hurt him, and I don't want to hurt him. I don't know how I'm going to tell him. Tell him what, ma'am? I tried to make him understand. All the time before he left for overseas. It was almost two years ago. I tried to make him understand. He wouldn't listen. He didn't believe me. He thought I was fooling. Yes, ma'am. I love him, Sergeant. I tried to explain. I didn't want to be alone, having him away all the time. I knew there was going to be trouble. I knew it. I didn't want to be alone. He didn't understand. He only said I was fooling. Yes, ma'am. He left for overseas in October. Walter, almost two years ago. I went down to Wilmington. I saw him leave on the boat. I stood there and watched him go. I wasn't going to see him. 24 months. I wouldn't see him. No children, no family. Just a two-room apartment. If he only believed me. If he only would have taken me with him. Where were you living at that time, ma'am? Up the coast, just this side of Santa Barbara. I told Walter. I couldn't be alone. I needed something. If he only had children, he'd only taken me with him. It didn't have to be this way. He could have taken me with him. He could have arranged it. He wouldn't. He left me here alone. I tried to tell him. He left me here alone. Yes, ma'am. I took it for a year, a whole year, to an apartment, being alone. I wrote to Walter twice a week. He wrote to me. It didn't do any good. He didn't want me with him. A whole year. And it got too much. You mean you could have joined him overseas? I don't know why. I kept writing to him. He kept putting me off a whole year. It got too much. Two-room apartment, alone. You can't spend your life that way. I started going out, having dates. I had to get out. Started going to parties, different people. Guess I drank too much. Didn't want to be alone. Guess I always drank too much. Mm-hmm. There's one party. Don't even remember who I went with. Guess I was drinking. I don't know. When I left, I don't even remember who I was with. It didn't have to be this way. It didn't have to happen like this. Are you all right, Ms. Lewis? There's something we can get you? No, I'm all right. I didn't know what to do when I found out. Oh, the doctor, he didn't understand either. I mean, the way I felt. He said the baby would be born in June. I cried. He didn't understand. Yes, ma'am. When the time came, I went to Tucson, Arizona. Had my baby. At least I wasn't alone. I used a different name at the hospital. Dorothy Miller. Maybe it wasn't Walter's baby, but it was mine. It was mine. I thought at first it wouldn't make much difference, but it did, though. It did. Yeah? I knew what it'd mean. I loved Walter, and I still love him. But if he found out, I knew what it would mean. I couldn't even think about it. I love Walter. I couldn't even think about telling him. So you figured on giving up the baby, huh? Giving him away, is that the idea? I can't tell you how many times I worked it out in my mind. Day after day, I almost went crazy with it. Walter, the baby, which one? I finally decided, Walter. Don't you think it's fair? Don't you? Well, I wouldn't know, ma'am. It's your decision. It's up to you. I don't know how to tell him. Won't you help me, please? Help me tell Walter. All right, if you like. It's such a terrible thing. I mean, to make a choice when you have to hurt somebody have to choose between the two of them. One of them has to be hurt. Ma'am? My husband or my baby. Which one? 10.38 a.m. At Mrs. Lewis' request, Ed and I stayed on at the hotel room until her husband, Army Captain Walter Lewis, returned. He was a tall, dark-haired man in his late 30s. Dark eyes, tan complexion. Mrs. Lewis was waiting in the adjoining room. It wasn't easy, but as best we could, Ed and I briefed the husband on what had happened. His first reaction was fairly normal. He took it pretty hard. We kept on talking to him. After a while, he calmed down. We laid out the whole story for him again. She turned the baby over to the police, is that it? She gave the baby up? Yes, sir. She figured it was the only thing she could do. Kind of hard to believe, isn't it? What's the answer? What am I supposed to do? Well, sir, I know it's none of our business, Captain. I think you might try looking at it from your wife's point of view, maybe. What do you mean? Well, it's pretty obvious. She's still in love with you. I think she's showing you that. Yeah? Well, she was in a jam. It was a big choice for her to make. She knew she was wrong. She made a mistake. She was ready to pay for it. It was either you or the baby. She knew that. She decided to give up the baby. The baby's all right now? Somebody's taking care of it? Yes, sir. Baby boy. Where's Marge now, my wife? In the next room. I want to see her. 
Well, maybe you should wait just a little while. No, it's all right. Just want to tell her something, aren't you? Marge? What can I say, Walter? Sorry. Sorry, there isn't any else I can say. You don't have to say anything, Marge. You can do what you want. I won't blame you. You've got a right to do anything you want. I just want to tell you, Walter, I love you. And I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Sit down, Marge. Come on, sit down. I won't blame you, Walter. Anything you do, I won't blame you. It's going to be all right, honey. There's nothing to cry about. Everything will be all right. Try and take it easy, dear. We got a little mistake here. I guess I made my share of it. Let it work out. Officer? Yes, sir. I'd like to ask you a favor. You got a car downstairs? Yes, sir, we do. I wonder if you'd mind dropping us by the hospital. I'd like to see my son. you have just heard was true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On Thursday, August 15th, a meeting was held in the district attorney's office, city and county of Los Angeles, state of California. In a moment, the results of that meeting. And now here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. Friends, you've just heard the 130th consecutive dragnet broadcast for Fatima. Now, the only reason we're able to bring you these programs is because so many of you have switched to Fatima. If you haven't tried Fatimas yet, I wish you'd do this. Buy a pack and compare them with the king-size cigarettes you've been smoking. You'll find Fatima gives you an extra mild and soothing smoke. You'll like Fatima's better flavor and aroma. What's more, I kind of think you'll agree with me. Fatima's the best of all king-size cigarettes. At the meeting in the district attorney's office, it was decided that in the interests of justice, no criminal complaint be filed against Mrs. Marjorie Lewis. The baby was released to the custody of her and her husband. Ladies and gentlemen, Betty Mills, Western representative of Radio and Television Mirror magazine. The editors of Radio and Television Mirror are happy to announce that in the annual awards poll conducted by Radio and TV Mirror magazine... American radio listeners from coast to coast have voted Dragnet, their favorite program of its type, for the second consecutive year. In addition, the nation's radio listeners have voted Jack Webb, their favorite dramatic radio actor. Thank you very much, Betty, on behalf of our cast, our entire production staff, and myself. Be sure to read the feature story about Jack Webb in the current issue of Radio and Television Mirror magazine, now on the newsstands. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police, W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Barney Phillips, Virginia Craig, Harry Bartell, Helen Cleave. Script by Jim Moser. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. Fatima Cigarettes. Best of all king-size cigarettes has brought you Dragnet, transcribed from Los Angeles. Next, it's Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons, on NBC. NBC.